We're going to have to speak loud and speak good. Tonight, we're welcome to the College of Complexes. You know, there is one thing that our college is missing these days, and that's a jingle. How about I propose this one? Relax, sit back, enjoy the speech. Relax and heckle the oratory. Speak your mind and speak it well. The College of Complexes, the plague rubber be the thick. And now let's introduce Brown. Hi. And the thing is working after all. What's your day job? Yeah. <laughs> it is now, Brown. Hey, Bernie. How's John LeBeau doing? He's doing all right. You know, we have rules here. The first rule is... One fool at a time. One fool at a time. One, even if you resemble that, it's the rule. And we have a second rule that we do not insult anyone personally here. They turned the volume down. Oh, really? Said CBS. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> public check on Congress, a new national legislative accountability from Bill Richmond. Hooray! You want the lights off? Yeah. Or, no, I, can, you, can everybody see? No. Let's uh. Well, somebody move this projector. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Charlie, for helping me we out lost here. Lost illumination. And, uh, me yeah. this. Oh, we lost yeah. illumination. Ooh. Oh, I Ooh. think he's blanked it. The projector's on. There. Yeah. Okay. okay. And uh, Paul, thank you for your technical support, and Tim, uh, you as well. Thank you for doing um, I had been to the public or to the um, College of Complexes about 12 years ago. So when I came back again, I was looking around the room to see if I could figure out what the politics was here. I noticed uh, Charlie's button, but I couldn't exactly tell how many nines were on it. <laughs> For a second there, I thought there were three. Nine, nine, nine. <laughs> uh, but uh, then as I got a little closer, I was able to uh, what you're dealing with here. I'm competing tonight, as you know, with the Republican presidential debate in Des Moines. Uh, and I don't feel at a particular disadvantage. <laughs> in any case, the food here is good, and I've got a great idea. It won't necessarily be the most entertaining speech you've heard, uh, but it'll be something that I hope you'll think about, take away with you, and, uh, and use as you try to figure out how we can make our government more effective. Well, uh, my name is Bill Bridgman, and uh, here's a brief uh, recap on, on who I am. I have a business background, basically. I also have been teaching economics at an MBA program for the last 12 years as an adjunct uh, professor. Grew up in the Twin Cities, so I basically have a Midwestern orientation. Uh, came to Chicago about 40 years ago. I have a good education, a BA in economics, and also an MBA. But the most important uh, qualifications is that I have middle-of-the-road politics. Uh, they used to call it Eisenhower Republic, and I'm not sure who, who knows what that means anymore. Uh, but, uh, and I have three grown children, which is probably the most important thing. Uh, I, like most people in this room, are wondering what kind of a country we're going to be turning over if we can't get our government straight in this country. So here's our agenda. Let's talk about how dysfunctional Congress is, and I hope there's not going to be too much pushback on that question. 
Then we ask ourselves this, if at some point we're willing to tinker with our system of checks and balances in order to get a better government, what might that solution look like? We'll talk about the pros and cons of that solution, which is a public check on Congress, and then where do we go from here? Well, how, how bad is our government? And I've listed here my top ten list of uh, policy failures, some things that have not been addressed for many, many years, things that have been addressed in a thoroughly suboptimal way. Uh, you can, uh, each, each one of these has its own history in terms of how it's been uh, addressed, uh, and uh, I don't plan to go through each of them individually, uh, but uh, I think the case is pretty strong that each and every one of these important policy issues has not been uh, thoroughly and adequately addressed by Congress. Well, um, a lot of people agree that Congress is the primary culprit, and I've just picked out a few of uh, these books here that are my my own personal library is filling up with books like this. Congress and the Decline of Public Trust, Dysfunctional Congress, Congress and the People, The Liberty of Democracy on Trial. And the one on the right here, uh, The Broken Branch, is, is really a fairly definitive work. If you're going to just read one, read this one. It's co-authored by a member of the Brookings Institution and a member of the American Enterprise Institute. They represent different frameworks in terms of how they think about government, uh, but they agree that, that we've got a severely broken branch, that broken branch is Congress. Things have been building up for a long time, but I think we all, uh, anyone reading the paper here for the last year, year or so knows that we have reached a new low in terms of what's, what's going on in Washington. Uh, we know that these pledges that uh, congressmen have been making, the most notorious one is the Grover Norquist tax pledge that uh, doesn't allow Republicans any wiggle room whatsoever in terms of uh, compromising on revenues, increased revenues uh, for uh, our budget. We know that uh, as soon as the 2010 congressional election occurred, uh, the majority, the minority leader in the Senate uh, said that uh, the number one objective for Republicans was to make Obama a one-term president. And uh, he thought he was speaking off the record. Uh, on the other hand, it became widely known, and everything that's happened that this gentleman has done has backed up as bad as his primary goal. We've had no budget for a couple of years. We've been operating on continuing resolutions. When those continuing resolutions run out, the government shuts down, and we just about reached that point in March. We had a new default in August uh, after a tremendous wrangling, and uh, the result of that was this super committee that was going to put everything together, find some major solution to our finances by uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, that super committee effort failed. Uh, many urgent needs have been ignored. In fact, everything has been ignored for the last couple of years. It's been one of the least performing Congresses that we've had, uh, and it's uh, and that's a uh, uh, that's a title that's had a lot of competition. And when we look at what's going on in terms of both Tea Party people and occupiers, uh, the, these movements basically share the same frustration that we're not getting a government that's responsive uh, to the American people. Um, well, we know, we basically know what the problem is, and it's this accountability paradox, uh, that we are severely dissatisfied with Congress, but we overwhelmingly re-elect our incumbents. We just don't feel like we've got a way to hold Congress accountable for its overall performance. And let me just show you a couple of things here. Here's the Congress approval rating. This particular poll, the Gallup poll, shows it at 13%. I view this as a dangerously low number, not just in terms of, of how poorly Congress is performing, but also in terms of what we think of our government. And if we have this type of thought process, this kind of approval rating of our government, uh, and this continues for an extended period of time, it's frankly a dangerous situation. You've all been reading probably about the 9% approval rating in another poll, and you've even heard John McCain's joke 
about, well, if we're at 9%, that means we're down to blood relatives and paid staffers. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, it was only the blood relatives and paid staffers that were laughing at John McCain's joke. And here's the re-election rate, 90% plus for the House of Representatives as shown here. Uh, so 13% uh, approval rate for Congress, 90% plus re-election rate. Uh, we just don't have the tools to hold Congress accountable. Uh, now this goes to 1990, uh, 2008, as you can see here. 2010 was a wave election year. It was a slightly higher turnover rate. 83% uh, was the number there. On the other hand, what this shows also is that at 83%, a slightly larger turnover, you'd be hoping for a better Congress, a better government. Uh, the fact is that the last couple of years it's just been, been as bad or even worse. So large turnovers don't necessarily mean uh, aren't tied to better performance. Well, why do we keep re-electing our members back to Congress if we're so unhappy with them? These are also well-known phenomena. Number one is uh, the gerrymandering process. That's going on right now in every state in the Union that has to readjust its districts for the new census. And in Illinois, the expectations are extremely high. It's one of the few states that's controlled from top to bottom by the Democrats and the Democrats in Washington have put the pressure on uh, the uh, Illinois Democrats to come up with as many Democratic seats as possible. Uh, same thing is happening in other states around the, around the country. Campaign finance favors the incumbents. We know that. It's very easy, much easier for an incumbent to raise money for his campaign than it is for a challenger. Uh, incumbents find it easy to win the blame game. You know, it's not my fault. I've been to two, I've been to two town hall meetings in the last six months. One with my con guy that's my congressman right now, a Republican, the, the woman who's going to be my Congress lady after the redistricting. A uh, strong, uh, staunch liberal, and uh, they both have no problem uh, blaming uh, politics at large and blaming the other party for the fact that nothing gets done. They'll both get reelected in all likelihood. Uh, seniority benefits constituents from a rational basis. You're looking to make a choice on who you're going to elect. You know that there's nothing that Congress reveres more than senior level. Why would you take a guy that's got two or three terms in Congress, who may be the head of a subcommittee, who's got some contacts in the administration, if you've got something that needs to get done, that guy's got a little more clout, maybe he can do something for you. Uh, and uh, why would you throw that away and put in a brand newcomer uh, as a result of what's happening at the national level? More often than not, you just don't think that way. You want a congressman that's got a little bit of seniority, a little bit of strokes, just in case you need them to do something for you. Beyond that, we tend to like our members of Congress, whether they're our same party or not. We think we know them, we, they talk to them, they sound reasonable, uh, they answer their e our emails, uh, they know what's going on in our district, they know that we like Lake Michigan clean and we like uh, the trains to be safe. Uh, so at a local level, and some, some people used to say, all politics is local, uh, our congressmen tend to be able to deliver in a, in a reasonable way. And then, of course, the last question here. What difference would it make to put in somebody else? And as I say, we saw this this last time around. Uh, as, as large a wave election as we have been seen in about 60 years in terms of Republicans taking over for Democrats, uh, what you would expect perhaps that the, the uh, Congress would be more accountable, more change, more constructive behavior, and in fact it hasn't been that way. What does that mean for us? Well, there's no reason, in my opinion, now this is where you've got to be with me on this one, or I hope you leave you time. Uh, that there's no reason to expect the system to fix itself. It's just working fine as it is now for the members of Congress. They don't really have to deliver too much, and yet they get themselves re-elected. We want to improve the way our government works. Some outside intervention is necessary, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, the public check on Congress. So where do you have to be if you're going to be ready to, to listen to this? Well, you have to believe that Congress is severely dysfunctional. I think most people in this room share that common denominator with me. 
you don't see this political system fixing itself, and you're willing to consider the option of constitutional amendment uh, if it offers a sound solution. And uh, if we're at that point, then, then we can talk about the public check on Congress. Here's the basic crux of it. What if, in addition to being, being able to vote on your individual member of Congress, your congressman, your congresslady, <coughs> that particular seat in Congress, and your two senators, what if in addition to that you could also vote on Congress as a whole, hold Congress as a whole accountable for what it's doing? Public check on Congress, then, is this new <coughs> constitutional accountability for Congress as a whole to the American citizenry as a whole. It would allow citizens to periodically express their approval or disapproval, not just in a poll now, like the Gallup poll takes or the other polls, but in terms of a ballot that you market next on. The consequences for significant sustained disapproval would be significant. And in addition, uh, and this would be in addition to your existing election, so you're not giving anything up. This is just one, one more opportunity to mark something on the ballot, and this would have important consequences. Well, here's uh, the specific formulation. If you've got a hold of my handout that I brought several weeks ago, you probably are um, you know, have this in front of you, or you have it at home. If not, I hope you'll pick a copy up tonight and take back with you. But one formulation of the public check on Congress would be that a new nationwide referendum held every 10 years. Now, it's not something that's being held all the time. It's just once every 10 years. And Congress needs a 25% approval to pass. These are low numbers. These are infrequent checks. These are not radical propositions. This is coming from an Eisenhower Republican. Uh, so this is a fairly modest step in terms of this new accountability, but it's going to be, uh, I think, make, make an important difference. If Congress gets less than 25% approval in that vote, uh, then another vote is held the next year. They've got one year of grace period here before they face an even more important vote. If again, as you can see here, if again Congress is below 25% in this second vote, then one-third of the members of the House and the Senate, and we're talking now about the most senior third, the leaders in Congress, the people who are your your speaker and your heads of the party, the people who are the heads of all the com major committees, the people who are the ranking members in the other party of the committees and the subcommittees. One third of the members of the House and the Senate, the most senior members, are to be replaced at the next general election for Congress. And they cannot run again for 10 years. So they're basically, basically out. Well, what does this mean, or what are the key features of this? Uh, first of all, it creates this new collective accountability for the members of Congress. It puts 145 representatives in the House of Representatives on the bubble. It puts 33 senators on the bubble, the senior leaders, the most senior leaders of both parties. This is the key ingredient here that creates this new accountability. They need to compromise with each other to get things done as opposed to appealing to their most extreme members of their base. You have people like John Boehner saying that he, he will work across the aisle with moderate members of the Democrats, and you get Nancy Pelosi obliged to do the same thing, rather than going to the most, uh, most extreme members of their own base uh, to work up either health care in the case of the Democrats or uh, budget uh, mechanisms in the case of the Republicans. Uh, and you'd wind up with something that the country as a whole uh, would be would find acceptable as opposed to the, what I would call, botched policies that we've seen so far. Okay. Remember this, the intention is to shape them up, not to, not to shift them out. It's to create a new incentive within Congress to work together and deliver something that we're going to be happy with, where we'll, where we'll give them that 25, 30, 40, 60 percent approval rating and uh, give them really a vote of confidence as opposed to voting them out. So that's the key thing here, not to punish them, but rather to give them the incentive uh, to deliver what they, what they owe the American people. 
Another key feature is that it helps to neutralize the special interests and in the French political factions. You will not find any more pledge takers uh, here. That they, no, no congressman would risk making a pledge to Grover Norquist uh, if that means they're going to be alienating the center of the American public. And 90%, um, and by the way, of the American public believes that uh, politicians should compromise on major issues. Every poll you've seen that asks the American public as a whole to express where they are on key values questions. There is enough of a centrist majority in America to allow a, a, a group of congressmen in the middle to find that position. And I think another benefit is that it establishes a new 10-year planning horizon. Remember this public check on Congress occurs once every 10 years. It's going to give them plenty of time to get it right. If they have to figure out campaign finance reform and then report to you uh, 10 years from now to, tell, to make their pitches of why they should be retained, they're going to have put together a commission that really studies campaign finance reform, gets the right proposals, something that is something like the old Bragg commissions, if you remember those, or like the super committee was supposed to be, where something is put together, Congress has to buy into it, and it becomes... Um, basic policy. So with the new 10-year horizon, you know, right now they think in terms of two years, sometimes senators might think in terms of six years, but if we've got a 10-year deal by which people can work on policies on immigration and education, <coughs> to work at how defense needs to be realigned, uh, consistent with our new yeah. capability of, uh, of what we can afford to do, uh, then I think we're going to get a much more constructive uh, thought process. And uh, the other thing about the public check on Congress is that it allows Congress to do the right thing on its own. We're not micromanaging what they need to do, as is done in California, for example, with every initiative and recall that, uh, that uh, goes on there. Uh, what we're really saying is that Congress, do the right thing. In 10 years, come back to us and tell us what you've done. And we'll know it when we see it. We're not going to tell you. We're just going to know it when we see it. A little bit like pornography, except hopefully a lot more pleasant to look at. And I think it also creates a new bond between Congress and the public. Here's, here's the big win for members of Congress. They now have a new mandate. They have a new vote, a new affirmation from the public as to what they're doing. Not just your individual congressman, your individual congress lady who's got a majority vote and goes back. It's Congress as a whole has been affirmed by for the public. It puts them back where the founders intended them to be, as the so-called first branch of our, uh, of our three-branch government. And, uh, and if they've got that affirmation, they can stand up a lot more strongly to the president when they need to. I mean, these, uh, these war declarations that we've seen, certainly I remember the Vietnam War Declaration, they didn't even know it was a declaration. They called it a resolution. Uh, for the Gulf of Tonga. The Iraq War was uh, really kind of a travesty in terms of a war declaration. Not that we shouldn't declare, declare war, but Congress didn't go through the process that they needed to go through to be the stand-up branch to make that call. This is going to make them, and this is going to allow them to do that. Another key feature is going to focus issues as opposed to personalities for the public. Uh, the public is going to have to make that, uh, that vote every, once every 10 years. What do they think of Congress? And uh, right now, uh, when we have debates, it's all about the personalities. Uh, this week, it's our good friend Newt Gingrich. Uh, last yeah. week, it was our good friend, uh, Mr. 999. Uh, next week, it'll be another good friend of his. I like James. Cool. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when you've got yeah. Democrats and Republicans together telling or asking you to vote or to keep them in Congress, they're not going to be talking about themselves as people. They're going to be talking about the policies that they put in place over the last 10, 10 years and why that record or that performance or that group of policies uh, justifies retaining their, their position. Uh, public uh, CC also can work effectively at the state and local levels. Uh, you know, we, our democracies, our system, our three, three branches kind of work throughout uh, the federal level, at the state level. I'd love to see the state of Illinois show some joint accountability between the Democrats and Republicans. 
with the, at the risk of uh, being uh, let go by the American people, so to speak. Um, it can be done even at the uh, municipal level. Uh, and it can also be done in other countries. Uh, I've talked to people in Japan, I've talked to uh, people in um, um, uh, Norway, and I mentioned it also to uh, uh, some people from India. And uh, they all say, you know, this is the kind of thing that might be helpful in, uh, in their, their democracies. It would have to be a little bit adapted for a parliamentary, a mature parliamentary system like in, um, like in Great Britain, uh, but it uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea to put the career politicians in, in a country like that at risk every once in a while as well. Uh, well, um, here are the concerns that I run up, or that people have expressed as, I, as I've explained this to them, and they might be the kinds of things that occur to you. And I've got a lot of details on each one of them. They can all be uh, responded to, I think, fairly well, but I don't really plan to do so, so I'm going to skip over some of these. But um, the primary concern that I've heard from uh, political scientists um, concerns uh, Direct, direct democracy things can be very, very messy. And they all think immediately of California, where direct democracy has run among them. And in other states too, like Wisconsin, with the recall up there, another situation that comes. We'll talk about that one in a little more detail. The others I'm going to skip over. Uh, but uh, there's a strong case that can be made for how we'll fix campaign finance. Americans believe that campaign financing is the primary flaw in our current government. Uh, at that first point in time where uh, the members of Congress, uh, both Republicans and the Democrats, need to stand together and tell you they've done something that justifies their retention, they're going to have to come up with something very, very positive on campaign finance. As far as replacing one-third of Congress would have caused too much disruption, I think that one's pretty easy to uh, dismiss. Uh, would it violate the framers' vision of democracy? The framers, none of the framers thought the Constitution was perfect uh, uh, when they uh, put it together. It was the best they could do in four months in Philadelphia. They gave us the amendment process to fix it. Uh, and, uh, and they would be aghast. They would be aghast at what is now uh, is going on in this country in terms of our government and the fact that we haven't, we haven't jumped in to try and fix it. And then why would the members of Congress who are critical to the amendment process support PCC? I think, I think there are some important ways that they can, some important benefits they can see to it, primarily related to the fact that um, their own self-esteem and, and the strength of their uh, branch of government will be substantially enhanced uh, if, uh, if they can get this uh, mandate from the people. Uh, this one in California is one I'll address here, uh, the California style direction of democracy. Um, that concern there uh, has to do with the fact that uh, in California, uh, you have anywhere between 10 and 30 propositions that are trying to get on the ballot, they need to get sorted out. But any time uh, someone can get the requisite number of signatures, uh, they, they, they have an opportunity to get uh, any kind of a proposition on the ballot. There's, there's some very famous ones like Prop 13 that, that screwed up the tax structure in California for the past 35 years. Uh, they get to gay rights, they get to stem cell research, all kinds of things wind up on the ballot. And these things can become force of law. Uh, uh, public check on Congress is only once every 10 years, if not every year that California has. There's only one issue that you vote on, and that's the overall performance of Congress, as opposed to this uh, plethora of uh, issues in California. The leaders of both parties are at risk. You can't use the uh, public checks in the way, for example, that the recall has been used in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, the, tar some of the Democrats are targeting Republicans. Republicans are targeting Democrats. Some people are targeting the governor now in, in Wisconsin. Uh, this is not going to allow specific targeting of a specific party. Leaders of both parties rise or fall together based on the public check. And then finally, uh, in order to actually 
recall and replace members of Congress. It requires two supermajorities. 75% or more of the people need to vote them out in two separate elections a year apart. So two supermajorities are required over the course of a year. As, I, as, I, as I've expressed it here, the coolest heads will prevail. Uh, you won't get a lot of hothead type voting. Uh, in, in California, it really only takes 51% in one election, and uh, you know the passions can put something into law. That can't happen with these. Well, as I say, I'm going to skip over some of these others now, so bear with me. chickens here, none of us was born yesterday, we've seen this problem for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and we know that uh, it's been getting worse, and then there's this gap between recognizing that it's happening and mobilizing something to, to fix it. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit like a boiled frog. Are you, you're, you're familiar with that term? A frog that's sitting on the hot plate? They keep turning the temperature up and up, but each time it's just enough, it's just a small enough new gradation of heat that I don't really feel until it gets so hot that it finally, finally kills the frog. Uh, we're, we're not there yet, but that's, that's, how, that's the phenomenon that I think we need to be thinking in terms of. Take a look at the people's movements here, the Tea Partiers and the Occupiers. Their focus, on, uh, their focus is on expressing their frustration. You don't really see a group mobilizing themselves to think through uh, fixes to the system. And uh, this, this is what needs to happen. Here's the kind of solution we hear about. Uh, Curtis and Leroy, not all politicians are two terms. One in office and one in prison. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, that's uh, that. that uh, we in Illinois could relate to this. Uh, but uh, you know, that's punishing. That's punishing the politicians, and we need to get beyond that. We need to get beyond the anger. We need to get beyond the frustration. We need to change the incentives uh, to shape them up, not to shift them up. Uh, this last point here, most political and constitutional experts are especially timid about the out-of-the-box proposals. I've taken up, taken up this idea with an awful lot of people. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, they're still speaking in terms of the most modest of baby steps. Uh, some would like to tweak the filibuster rule. Uh, some would like to uh, do something to cut back on uh, expenses uh, for staff. Uh, the term limits is a punitive type of thing that is not going to change behavior in Congress. It's just going to change the blood in Congress every once in a while. We need to think beyond baby steps now and think about what are the, what the more significant interventions that are possible to, to get this democracy where it needs to be. The other thing that we run into, and you and I experience this all the time, it's human nature. We equate our bad government with bad weather. You can complain about it, but there's really nothing you can do. Uh, that's a hurdle we need to get over. 
Well, I, I hate to say this, but I think I have to say that, uh, to be honest with you, that uh, this is an idea whose time has not yet come. Uh, there's not a, uh, a critical mass of people who have thought through the problems of government and thought through the solutions of government to start to make that leap and say, yes, we, we, need, a, we need a more... Uh, uh, a more, a more serious fix uh, than, than is on the table at the moment. Um, we need, to, uh, we need to, though, to focus on educating experts in mainstream media so that at the right time, this thing will be on the table and people will be able to talk about it. I think the main supporters are going to be 18 to 30 year olds, the people who have the biggest stake in whether our government gets fixed or not. And. Um, I, I do plan to do a little bit of work with college newspaper editors, for example, to see uh, these guys can think things pretty uh, through pretty clearly. Uh, maybe there's a, a way for them to uh, be part of the solution here. In any case, when Americans are ready for serious reform, hopefully PCC will be on the agenda somewhere and can be uh, ready to uh, be thought through and, and evaluated in the right way. Well, here are a few thoughts for you. Uh, please pick a copy of, of the handout uh, that I have here or check out my website, publiccheckoncongress.com. Uh, please uh, help bridge the gap between frustration and finding solutions. Uh, frustration is what we're all feeling right now, but we've got to get beyond that and say, okay, you know, it's not about getting mad at the people. Uh, it's, a, it's more about giving them the right incentives. The bars is a government of, by, and for the people, then we, the people, must accept the responsibility for fixing it. And here's the thought that, I, that keeps me motivated. I've got three boys, and if I want to turn over a better America to them, I've got to turn over to them a better government. Thank you. All right. Very good. Like this stuff, well, better we, government. We are what do you think of your bus conference committee, Margaret? Yeah. Yes, why did you uh, uh, propose only 25% approval uh, vote every 10 years? I should think it would be, should be maybe like 51% or something, so the majority is approving of their. She asked the question of why only 25% approval, why not something more like 51, you know, a majority? Um, I don't. I don't think we want, in my own view, and by the way, that's a negotiable item. So if you're already at the point of saying, why don't we make it 51, then you're, you're already part of the solution. Uh, because you've made that leap of saying we should do something like this to fix our government. I picked 25 because I personally don't want this thing to happen very often. I, want, I, I view this as something kind of like the impeaching and conviction, conviction of a president. It needs to be that infrequent that we toss these members of Congress out. What we want to do is give them the incentive to shape up. Uh, so for me, this is kind of a last resort. Um, we have never convicted, we have never impeached and convicted a president yet. We have impeached uh, two of them. And we've driven one into resignation. Uh, but um, I, view, I view that it can be that kind of threshold rather than just a simple majority. But if you're already at raising that question, then we're, we're already targeting. So that's that's a terrific uh, step forward. Walter? I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, for PCC to come in, do you think this country would really have to hit rock bottom? After all, we didn't get all these social programs enacted until we had the Great Depression. And my second question would be, how would PCC bump up against the United States Supreme Court uh, Citizens United decision, which I thought was really horrible? Well, there are two very good questions. Um, your, fir your first question, uh, I, I agree with you. We're, we're not at that point where, uh, where, where, where people are prepared to say, let's un undo or redo what our founding fathers did. The Constitution has come down to us. I mean, you remember what you were taught when you were in social studies back in eighth grade. It came down from on high, like the Ten Commandments. You know, you don't you don't re chisel the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so it's uh, it's going to take uh, quite a uh, significant um, threshold of that, of of of, uh, of 
to overcome an awful lot of inertia to get something that gets deep into the Constitution, the system of checks and balances, and re redoes. None of our amendments have really done that yet. The only one that has really come close to rejiggering the checks and balances has been the one that changes, uh, you know, how senators get elected. And you could also say that maybe the 22nd Amendment on two terms for a president got close to it too. But this is this goes beyond that, and we're not we're not there. Your other your other question was very important too, but I don't recall what it was. Uh, how would PCC bump up against the <laughs> well, uh, citizens? The Supreme United Court States. can't can't stop PC if it's a constitutional amendment. Yeah. But you raise a good point. You want PC to be the thing that triggers some serious campaign financing reform. And if it takes another constitutional amendment to tell the Supreme Court that corporations are not people, then there's no better way to get that started than by a Congress that's got PCC on its back, watching what it does, and it's going to say that you've got to get that constitutional amendment started now, uh, and then tell the Supreme Court what to do. There's also another trump card that, you, that uh, the Congress can play on Supreme Court justices. They approve them in the first place. So when new ones come on, they can tell them, you think corporations are people. They've never approved it Romney on that basis. And if it gets down to it, they can actually take the Supreme Court justice and that's, that's a very part of the solution. Uh, Craig Thompson and then Joe Mayer. And then you can yeah, it seems like um, this doesn't um, address a problem, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a big problem is that as new congressmen come and go, they keep hiring the same old staffers, and it's the same operatives, and the same lobbyists in Congress. So how do we, how do we keep from getting just the same old staffers running things the same old way when we get new Congress? We have a huge problem in that respect. It's not just Congress staffers, but we have uh, you know, this whole bulwark of uh, administration uh, people we have this incredible back and forth. I mean, 50% of former congressmen go on to become influence peddlers, is really all you can call them of one kind or another in Washington. Uh, they weren't, Duke Fingers was not a lobbyist to be sure, uh, but he was an influence peddler. I think what you have to do is you have to start at the top. What do congressmen do and what are the incentives that drive them to do something better than what they're doing now? Uh, I think that PCC does that. Uh, whether it solves all the problems, no, it certainly doesn't. But it starts the process in the right direction. Okay, Joe? Uh, I have a problem with PCC. When I look at some of the uh, legislation uh, that has been overwhelmingly approved in some states, like anti-abortion legislation or anti-gay legislation or things of that nature, uh, you're asking the nation as a whole to, to not be that 90% that disapprove of Congress, but rather to have their own prejudices, religious or otherwise, against certain uh, policies of the government. Yeah. How can you account for that? I'm not sure I quite follow your question. Um, are you saying that 90% of the people of the country's prejudices will... No, 90% of the population disapproves of Congress, and yet we see in many states the majority of the population support the legislation that has been passed by those state legislatures prohibiting uh, abortion, anti-gay rights, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not so sure you do see that. You're, you're saying you see large majorities in, 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 in states supporting constitutional amendments that... Uh, not constitutional, state legislatures. State legislatures. Expanding that into the, uh, the, the national picture is something else. Well, uh, the, the good th one of the things about the public check on Congress is that it's not a state-by-state -state deal. You know, we're not talking about uh, the Electoral College, for example, which is strictly state-by-state. -state. You're talking about the entire nation, one vote. Uh, and when you're when you're talking about 90 percent, 80 percent, or 75 percent of the nation as a whole in this case, you, know, you you have to be able to trust what they come up with. I mean, if we can't trust the people, uh, then I don't know where we are in this country. Uh, but that's that's kind of what the basis of this is on. If we can say that 75 percent of the people um, once at once a decade uh, can uh, can decide that. This is what we don't want Congress to do, or do want Congress to do. Uh, that's something I'm prepared to to place my bet on. Mike, thanks for the presentation. Um, Two-part question. 
one, uh, how much hard cold cash can a congressman receive uh, when he's in office by various means, either for re-election or other means, or do you know those rules as far as being lobbied and, and funded by different, for different things, if there's exact rules on that. And the second part is, is there some kind of website that points out all these 500 or 600 congressmen, who is paying them off? Uh, there are, who is uh, funding them, or who is? There are websites that identify the contributions to different congressmen, and they're, and they're pretty good and they're pretty detailed. I don't know, but they, uh, maybe somebody in this room knows those, those websites. Uh, but they are available. Uh, but if you ask, uh, what are the limits on congressmen raising money for their campaigns? Uh, or anything. There, there is a like a twenty-five hundred dollar personal contribution, uh, and then you can double that between the primary and the and the uh, general election. There are bundlers that take massive numbers of these things and give them to individual congressmen. There's a lot of soft money out there that is available to support campaigns. And we saw what uh, Michelle Bachman was able to do uh, in the last congressional race that she ran. She, she ran not too far from my home district of Minnesota, uh, near, near the Twin Cities. She raised $14 million nationwide. And uh, in a congress congressional race that shouldn't have cost more than a million dollars. So that was, that was what she had going for her on her presidential run. Huge funds that she raised in the congressional campaign. Uh, Ivan Roeda. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, the structural uh, changes uh, you're proposing uh, are designed, are address certain evils. And I'm wondering, um, those evils seem to be quite a bit more flexible than our system is at, you know, confronting them. So I'm wondering, you who have studied the system and thought it through, how will they make adjustments in their political campaigns? And uh, my, my thinking right away is they're going to look for candidates that are have a short-term horizon as far as their political interests and in making a long-term career. They're not going to go for long-term career candidates. They're going to go for short-term. Uh, is that your thinking, too? Well, um, when you pick 10 years for, for a horizon, you are assuming that congressmen want to spend a significant number of years in Congress. Uh, this would, you would have to change it if you anticipated that congressmen would good, get in for two years and get out, do their, do their worst, and not, not get caught up in a PCC referendum. So if that were the case, you'd have to make, make some changes to it. Uh, but um, my, my view is this, and I attended, I attended a, a group called the Conference on the Constitutional Convention in, in Boston. It was a combination of Tea Partiers and Harvard Law Professors that got together. And their primary concern was campaign financing, which most people agree is a serious problem in this country. And, um, and, and the, the primary proposal there was to put in a council amend, amendment that would deal with campaign financing, put in lots and lots of details about exactly what could be done in that realm. And I, I agree with you. I think that if you tried to do that, you'd just be creating endless opportunities for loopholes in something that you'd have ground into your constitution itself. I think you're a lot better off doing something like PCC, where the public can stand back after 10 years, evaluate what you've done, and, uh, and decide if they like it, as opposed to putting in a lot of prescriptions about exactly what congressmen can and can't do or what the policy should be. I know. Uh, um, 10 years, do you really think that 10 years will make a dent in terms of, by 10 years they probably will be ready to retire, they have a pension for five years. Um, why do you think that we can do with a makeup program like you're suggesting rather than really the upward, the main issue, not, not that they need incentives. By the Constitution, they are supposed and paid for to represent the people. So they just should do their jobs. Why do you think that we should, that the risk of finding loopholes um, is enough not to really make a system change. The problem with voting, don't you think that the problem with voting is that the lobbyists are making all those decisions? 
that the content of, of any uh, uh, issue in Congress is not important, but what is important is who is the lobbies that pays most. Uh, and, and you think that the rates every 10 years are going to make a dent? I personally do, but if you're worried about five years versus ten years, or two years versus ten years, then again, we're already on the same wavelength, and we're just discussing about what is the right frequency for the public check on Congress. But I think the, the, basic, the basic idea of, and you're absolutely right, right now, you see members of Congress going to the floor of the House of Representatives to cast a vote. Ten minutes before they came to cast that vote, they just came from a fundraising function for themselves. And after the vote, they're on their way to another one. That's how money has dominated the thought process behind their their voting and behind their money. their mental framework. And uh, the public con talks. public check on Congress, I think, will oblige them to change that. The first time they go before the people saying, "Keep us in Congress," people are going to say. What have you done on campaign financing reform? What have you done to take the money out of the system? It's not going to be a question of McCain-Feingold uh, for uh, being, being up there, which is then undercut by the majority leader in the, in the Senate, uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, right away. It's going to be a matter of something that the, the public is going to know will stick, something that will make a difference. Uh, Charles West? Um, one of your points in your presentation was uh, if you had this 10-year referendum, you have to have a 75 percent like super majority of people voting. Okay, so that, that leads to like two things. And how do you uh, get 75 percent of people to vote? Only really, you know like current trends only like you know 30, 40 percent of that. And then is it a popular vote over the whole United States? Which does that imply that the urban areas will then have much more power over the rural areas? That's going to be one person, one vote. So if you're, wherever, wherever you are, that's where your vote is. I don't know that we're divided terribly much between rural and urban uh, thinking in this country. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, the basic idea is 75% of those voting. I mean, you don't have to get out to vote. 75% of those that vote can can implement a public check. So it's not 75% of all the registered voters. It's 75% of people that show up. It's just like a convert, just like any other vote. Okay. It's, a, it's the percentage of people that vote. All right. Charles? Anything that diminishes country vote is okay by my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Running for Congress, you run for a primary, you run for a general election and get elected. Now you're making recall a permanent fixture of the government. And the recall is done for a purpose in some locations, not wholesale, basically on seniority. I could be a shameless womanizer, but it's not my turn. And I don't get recall in your system. Now, I don't even agree. Personally, I don't believe in recall. The people have decided you served the term out, and unless you can prove some, well, yeah, what's the term for it? Being bad. Yeah. Why should you be subject to a third election? Because you don't like the way they voted. You don't like how Congress is performing. We're not talking about individuals. What does that mean? How I voted. Not, not That's the same thing. Question, I didn't do it. Recall is you were establishing an automatic recall. Recall is normally used for misconduct. Right. I've done nothing other than perhaps not vote the way you like. That's misconduct. But what you're saying is you, you would like to see the recall be, be individual and be targeted at those that uh, have, have screwed up. That's what it's used for now. That's right. Well, I'm saying we need to go beyond that. Beyond it? Yeah, beyond that, exactly. We need to say that Congress as a whole is accountable for what they have done. That's the whole point of public check on Congress. It's not a question of the, of the Tea Partiers uh, being voted out or the occupiers being voted out. It's a question that Congress needs to be given the incentive. They need to be given the incentive to do the right thing for the country. And the focus of the public check in Congress is on the leaders of Congress 
who are in the best position, especially in a seniority-driven organization like Congress, to get things done one way or the other. So it's not a question anymore of one group or another being accountable. That group of leadership screwed up and they're out, or that group of leadership did just fine and they continue. One, one follow-up and I'll be done. Too much time spent on campaigning. <laughs> Every two years, they're campaigning from day one. Six of your guys get old. Now you want to add a third campaign, and you want one third of the entire Congress to go out there fundraising and spending time campaigning. Talk about a waste of government achieving nothing. I think what you want is uh, you want Congress to stand before the American people once every ten years. Campaigning. Once every ten, a State of the Union address for Congress, basically. They'll be campaigning, right? Uh, well, uh, they're, they might be campaigning, they but they're, they're campaigning right they because they want to explain to you what they've done for you, Charlie. They feel they've got to explain what they've done. That's what uh, that's what this particular campaign would be. need another campaign like uh, a hole in the head. Uh, Tim, and then, uh, the, the, it's been said that Congress only has 13 percent approval rating. But if you look at the individual states, they seem to be okay with how the states are running. So my question is that in the, when they take the survey of the 30% of Congress not working, is it basically reflected because of the economy is the, is the main issue? I think the approval rating does, to a significant extent, reflect the economy. But the approval ratings for Congress have been low for a long time through thick and thin. Uh, the one time that Congress, Congress's approval rating got up close to 50 or 60 or even 70 percent was right after 9-11. Uh, before that, it's been continuously below 50 percent. And for the last five or six years, it's been between 20 and 30 percent. Now, now a very low deal. Uh, Karina, then Dave, and Tim. And then you, Mark. Okay. Uh, I was hoping you can provide a narration. Right now, uh, the people vote, and they vote a huge disapproval of Congress. Can you narrate what happens next in, in 2012? Or right now, they right now we've just had a vote, right? A public check on Congress vote, and overwhelmingly there was a disapproval. Can you guide me through a narration then of of, of what what happens next? Well, what? Uh, mechanically, what happens? What hap if the public check were in Congress, or were in effect right now, and if not 2012, for that 10 years for it to come into being, then at the bottom of your congressional ballot in 2012, next November, there would be a single question: Do you approve of what Congress is doing? The same question would appear throughout the entire country. If 75 percent of the people say no. And Congress has obviously served notice. They're basically impeached at that point. Uh, and they're served notice that the members of Congress. Well, members of Congress have been served notice that, they're, that, that, they, they, have, uh, that they, they are going to be facing the recall vote, the replacement vote, one year from next November. So November 2013, another vote is held. Uh, and if again they're below 25 uh, below 25 percent approval or 75 percent disapproval, uh, then those one third of the members of Congress are replaced one year later at the next regular congressional election, 2014. So it's kind of a two-year process if you get that far. So in, in the whole idea, though, is for uh, is for it never to get that far. I mean, now, if, if they're shaping up at all with respect to the incentive that's put in place as a result of PCC, uh, then they'll get a much higher approval rating than 25% in 2012, and they'll never have to face that question again for another 10 years. Doesn't that create an incentive to do very fast, short-term things to a piece of public? Let's say massive deficit spending that would eliminate unemployment, but drive us into severe um, deficit, but yeah. they would do that just to look in 12 months, I'm going to have a, a, another vote on my approval, so we better start spending money now and giving in the, the pork and making jobs. 
Well, you, 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 if you got to that point where there's that, where you're in that period where they've lost the first vote and they're worried about the second vote, uh, you, you would run that risk. Uh, again, it will depend on whether the uh, people are duped that way or not. I mean, if, you, if in the end you can't uh, uh, trust the people to make that call and to identify, you know. And you uh, trust that the people wouldn't make that call. People who are unemployed wouldn't want government to just. You may, you may you may run, you may run that risk. I won't I won't say you won't be running that risk. It comes down to your view of, of what the, what our democracy you know, depends on. Well, uh, David, and then you. No, I'm uh, sorry, Mark. All right, this question is due to the fact that you said that you were an Eisenhower Republican. Uh, in the late 1950s, the Supreme Court of the United States <coughs> handed down a couple of decisions that dealt with the rights of people who were falsely accused of being communists or whatever. These decisions were roundly denounced by President Eisenhower and by a number of other people. Where did you stand at the time on this matter? Well, I don't know that I supported everything uh, President Eisenhower did, but I thought that uh, basically the notion that, uh, for example, uh, he was the kind of person that both parties wanted to run as his, their presidential candidate. That type of centrist approach to how politics in this country might work is something that appealed to me. Yes. Can, can you please explain some kind of a logical disconnect? Because if in a congressional district, if there are one million people and you're not uh, trusting their will to send bad people, keep on sending bad people back, now multiply by 200, 200 million people you're going to be trusting that they're doing the right thing. I think there's a disconnect. Uh, maybe we need an education of well, I think that that's the problem that your congressman can appeal to you individually in your in your district, and at the same time uh, be part of the problem nationally with respect to how he's voting <coughs> on, on issues. And uh, the whole point then is to see if there's a way that the nation as a whole can take take stock of how Congress is doing, rather than just looking at the sum of the parts and saying, well, if each, if each person is happy with their congressman, the nation of the whole must be ecstatic. Uh, we know that's not the case. We need to find a new mechanism for establishing accountability for Congress's overall performance. I'd like to revisit the rephrase the question that was asked previously, and it has to do with the rights of minorities, and not just <coughs> minorities racially, but any kind of a, of a minority where you have the majority of the population, for example, in the mid-1800s would, would have voted for, the, uh, for maintaining slavery in the country, but if it was passed in the Congress being a human right not to be a slave, they would, and this is an example, that, they would, that a majority would disapprove of what Congress did, regardless of the fact that Congress was asking according to the Constitution, uh, or at least an interpretation of the Constitution. Or, for example, women's rights were not overly popular, or rights of gays were not, are not now considered by many people to be human rights. So that when you violate human rights, and the majority of people are in favor of that, and you have Congress passing laws that reinforce those rights, then the majority of people are going to disapprove of what Congress has done. And they, they'll vote Congress out. So how do you protect those minority rights in that case? Well, I think one of, one of the things that, uh, that is, is part of this is that nobody is voting on any specific issue. We're not saying we didn't like the way Congress voted on this, we didn't like the way Congress voted on that. We don't like how Congress performed on everything related to all the things that they've addressed over the last 10 years. Um, I won't disagree with you that there are issues certainly related to how minorities get protected in this kind of, in this kind of framework, but I don't think it's that much different from the problems we have right now in terms of making sure that 
minorities get the right kind of protection. I don't know that this adds to the problem, uh, but I, I agree with you, there are ways in which it doesn't necessarily ameliorate the problem. Lynn's <coughs> men. Uh, I, I haven't heard anybody else address the question of, you know, we're assuming that our Congress people, when they get there, uh, they're, they're voting their conscience or, you know, uh, you know have, do you have anything in your program to address the concept that what we have is criminals masquerading as our elected officials? They don't care about us because they're bathed in money and they're, they're paid to vote for corporate crimes. Like the banking thing, you know, what what can we do to remove some congressperson or senator that's actually involved in suppressing corporate crimes? That's against the old state pick. They should be removed immediately and prosecuted. You know, like the getaway driver in a bank robbery. We got uh, what 400 getaway drivers in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> um, right? I I think I think you've raised yeah. a very good point there. Uh, I will I will say this that uh, if if uh, the leaders of Congress need to stand up every, every 10 years and explain themselves, part of what they're going to have to defend is their record on enforcing their own ethics rules inside Congress. You'll have to have a situation, for example, and not, not to pick anyone in particular, but if you've had a member of Congress who uh, uh, violated their own ethics with respect to uh, uh, financial matters, and we've seen a number of those, that Congress has not acted on very quickly, you can assume with PCC that they will act much more rapidly in enforcing their own ethics and, in fact, strengthening their ethics rules. Uh, so um, you won't you won't do do away with all with all the uh, getaway drivers, uh, but uh, you will at least see I think some movement in the right direction. All right, Tim Bolger. <coughs> And then uh, Walter Collins and then Ed Rios. Would a similar type of recall election work for the Chicago Cubs and their winning oh, of the World yeah. Series? <laughs> 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 that is ridiculous. You know, I think they just had a recall. Yeah. <laughs> they just had a recall. It was kind of a top to bottom type of thing, and a lot of good people were flushed out in the process. Okay, Walter. <laughs> Would John Q. Public make a good decision about turning the government topsy-turvy after a 10-year period of being bombarded by the uh, Manchester <coughs> Union leader or the Chicago Tribune, which is bankrupt both physically and morally? I mean, what can we do about the propaganda, the uh, wordsmiths and the... Uh, Madison Avenue types that are constantly. You know, um, I think that part of the great advantage that polarizing voices have in America today uh, is that we have gerrymandered districts that are so safe that the only, the only fear that an incumbent congressman or an incumbent congress lady has is an attack from the fringe in their primary election. And that's where an awful lot of money comes in. That's when the Manchester Union leader steps up. That's where the polarizing voices, uh, you know, have their heyday, is by not not in the general election, but in the primary election. And uh, the public check on Congress is something that says, okay, you know, the fringe has their day in the primary elections uh, in election years, but the vast middle settlement of America will have its say in the public check on Congress. So I think it's a, it helps to neutralize to some extent uh, the kinds of things you're talking about. Oh. Ron, uh, some people didn't get the first question. Uh, There's a guy over here. Rios hasn't had a question. Okay. Oh, Martin, you wanted a question? I did. I could get his question. We want to be fair. You know, what, we see, what I think you're saying is that just as for a couple of centuries now we view the, the collection of people that make a corporation to result in as individuals, that individual has rights. I think you're saying that the collection of people that make up a political organization, a political body, in this case Congress, 
We should think of that political body as an individual no, no. and have a vote on that individual, whether we like it or not, if not the elements. But it's, it seems to be the same that? concept. No, is that Fair what you heard? Yeah, I think I think I think it, I think that's not a bad way of putting it. The way that I view Congress, or I think one one way of viewing Congress is that it is a team that's working to do the right thing for the country. Uh, we each vote for our participant on that team, but if the team itself is not performing adequately, then you find some way to provide them a collective incentive to do the right thing, something where they rise or fall together as opposed to being able to go back home to their district and say, well, I've got you that second General Electric um, a plant uh, um, engine uh, for your plant back home, so send me back, or I, I got you the bridge to nowhere, so send me back. No, it's what, how you, how you uh, contributed to the uh, overall benefit of the country that also counts to some extent. And that's why the public check in Congress is intended to create a collective incentive for people, for this team to work together, uh, as opposed to um, uh, being able to justify their behavior individually back home. Uh, so I think to some extent you're, you're seeing it that way. This is, what, this is what a business person would do. If you had a group of people working for you uh, that were not getting the job done, you'd build a collective incentive and say, look, work together as a team and uh, we'll succeed together. And uh, this is not going to trump the individual elections, but it's going to be something that happens every once in a while. Uh, uh, please, Mark. Well, why would the money politics matter? Well, I mean, and presumably it would slip through in some fashion. Wouldn't they just reorganize and get the money back in power in a different fashion? Uh, you, you raise a real... Real good point. Um, they, th this won't come easy. This is the kind of thing that really only happens uh, through a broad movement. As somebody said here earlier, we may have to reach a, 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 a moment of crisis in this country before we're going to do whatever the, the kinds of things are that are going to fix our government. But I think we're heading there. I mean, when you take a look at the things that have been addressed, when you look at the dynamics, decision making that's going on right now. When you take a look at what happened just this last year in terms of uh, critical, issues, critical issues that was just set aside so that points could be scored on the, uh, uh, the debt default discussion. Uh, we can't afford another 10 years, I don't think. And if we do, uh, then we're going to be speaking out of anger rather than out of some kind of, of uh, intelligent objective process for fixing our government. And if we're speaking out of anger, that's that's not a good thing. So it's going to take a movement to trump the kind of money. It's going to take pledges. Uh, people are going to have to make a pledge to you that they'll support the ACC when, they, when you elect them, as opposed to the pledge they've signed right now, not to change your taxes. Mala and then Charles. How do you overcome the fear? Because I think most people say Congress is not working, but they fear if there's a change, it's going to get worse instead of better. In other words, they're living with the fact that these things are bad, but trying to get to feel not to be unfair. It's unfair now, but I think more people feel that they're going to be more unfair if we try to fix it. How do you t how do you get over that fear? Uh, I think that's a good question. Um, I think people uh, uh, do tend to look at our Constitution as something pretty sacred. I mean, we, those of you who have been watching Glenn Beck <laughs> for the last day, year and a half, I mean, he's been telling you that there's nothing more sacred than what our founding fathers done, have done, uh, even though he may not quite understand it himself. <laughs> the fact is that our Constitution, of all the, of, of the 50 states and of the 100 and some countries around the world that have constitutions, democratic constitutions, ours is right now the most difficult to change. And it's part of that difficulty in changing that I think contributes to this mentality that it must be it must be sacred because it's so hard to change. And uh, that's something we're gonna have to find a way to get over. Yeah, Bill, I, I'm having a problem here. I don't know if I want 
to let belligerent hillbillies from Tennessee determine who my congressman is, <laughs> which your system would authorize. Uh, and them. I don't think the Tea Party <coughs> should have a voice in the 3rd District of Illinois. And they don't know what the issues are in the 3rd District of Illinois. They don't know where it is. Well, and they are, you are granting them. I'm granting them a voice in this process. They know they're, nothing I'm not about them anything they're part of the, they're other than some nebulous kind of feeling they have about government. This is, this is enlightened voting, some kind of, what, general, generalized attitude that I may have. They're never going to like government. So these people hate government. If you're, the Tea if you're Party hates all Congress. They're never going to vote in favor of retaining it. Um, it's going to be difficult for people like you to get there from here, sir. <laughs> I, I, it's not a question of hillbillies in Kentucky making a call. It's a question of America making a call. And they're part of it. Now, you're saying, well, I can't even trust them to be part of that process. Then fair enough. So all these people that go to Benton, Missouri, are going to determine like I was saying? This improves the system. Yeah, it does. I have my opinion. <laughs> One pull at a time, Charlie. You know, Thomas Jefferson said that the democracy is that going to work properly need an informed citizen. Now, he wasn't the first one saying he wasn't the last. I can trust him to go to that sense. Now, if we got people that's us. It's not important. And just cause you a computer, what you call a program, doesn't mean you're informed about the thing you're talking about. Yeah. Now, if we don't have that, what kind of, I'm, I'm pushing the response that you assume that will come from the masses would be for the masses' benefit. So, the uninformed don't know what they're going to stop in my opinion. Well, then you have a problem with how things are at the moment. Uh, because uh, this was basically government of the people, by the people, and for the people in this country. That's a flood of you. And if you have a problem with their collective voice, uh, then you probably have the same problem with their individual voices. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's. No, they're, they're all, Thomas Jefferson didn't believe our system was perfect. <laughs> uh, and uh, he won't believe that it'll be perfect uh, after the public check and uh, But the question is, we know we're in a bad spot. I know that. And I'm trying to convince a lot of people that we are. And the question is, is there a way to get to a better spot? My question is, does the masses know what that spot is? You know, what would, would, would they vote as a group for the good of the country, for the good of them themselves, or would they vote to cause so and so don't lack two men to Well, um, I think I think that we're not asking the public to vote on specific policy issues. We're asking them to vote on how Congress has done over the last decade. And uh, and I don't know what else to trust. If not, if not the people. Now, we, we have made our own decision in this country about who can vote. And Thomas Jefferson was in the group that said we need to be very careful about who we allow voting in this country. You know, we've gone a long way from what from what his vision of voting voting consisted. Uh, and for me, as far as I'm concerned, that was the, that's all been good to the good. Um, and I trust I trust the American people to basically do the right thing most of the time. But um, if you don't have that trust, uh, then you're going to have a problem with, with our current system uh, as much as you're going to have a problem with anything that we propose in this. Okay.
I have, oh, Tim, did you not what? have a question? Uh, just to follow up, oh. now that the Cubs have had the recall election, what are their prospects? Oh. I saw the movie Moneyball. Oh. I watched the Red Sox uh, have, have a slide of the century. I've yeah. seen the good and the bad from this process, yeah. from that yeah. process. Yeah. And I think it's about 50 50. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's an optimist. Optimist. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> That's a real And the White Sox. Well, we don't have a little minorities that are distributed From office to a recall election. I want to make sure that I'll be None of you guys. I vote against. I, I don't want to wait 10 okay, years. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Place the college I want to replace 130 to you every year. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Replace 
One third of the college every ten years. <laughs> 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 <Then either. laughs> I have to, first of all, thank the speaker because uh, uh, he, he speaks from knowledge, he, he has experience, and he was very clear about what he presented. But uh, most of all, because he gave me some hope, I am very desperate of seeing something that could produce some results. And uh, it's not only that we need to have a better democracy here, but we need to have a better democracy here because the world needs it too. Uh, we are an interwoven uh, amount of different uh, interests, countries, and we are fighting each other. And the United States has been a very, very disruptive uh, uh, among the nations as far as to producing wars, uh, uh, maintaining a system of profits for war, or war for profits, and uh, feeding the war with plastic shit, as I tell you all the time. Um, we destroy our own industry, uh, buying from China and from India uh, the things that we were used to produce here. Now, us a manager of a corporation, I was uh, in a position to have a team of people working in producing uh, uh, was products, was machines, was things. And when the system didn't work, you have to ask the leaders, what the heck are you doing? Why is it not working? Why you are not making progress in the project? Because this petty bullshit going between different guys trying to push their uh, own particular uh, issue, and uh, they, they, they prevent progress. So you have to make a decision once in a while and say, hey, you are not working out, get the fuck out of here. And so I, I see that's a very, very positive uh, way of dealing with this. And I think we desperately need something to correct what is going on. First of all, I think the guiding principle of what we're, we've heard tonight and what we, we experience is that we get what we deserve, and there's no way around that. Until we find out different ways to do things, as our speaker mentioned this evening, hello. Hello. Gene knocked over the sound box, so it's not the mic. Just talk loud, that's all. Yeah. Hey. Um, oh, all that technology, plastic well. shit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing I want to mention is that uh, you're 25% of the population which would disapprove of the uh, uh, general behavior of Congress coincides quite precisely with that 20 to 25 percent of the population that really is considered extreme right-wing or right-wing conservatives. So what we would be facing would be uh, a, a government uh, change by the 25 percent of the uh, population we consider uh, right-wing conservatives. Number three, the framers of the Constitution did not trust us. In the original Constitution, there was no Bill of Rights, none whatsoever. And in fact, when the Constitution was sent out to the various 13 states at that time, uh, the Western and Southern states refused to, uh, to come to uh, Philadelphia, uh, Independence Hall, in order to vote on it, so that they did not have a quorum. So they, it took another a long period of time before they <coughs> sent out the second draft of the Constitution, which again contained no Bill of Rights, but um, again, the southern and western states did not come. They refused to come to the Constitutional Convention. So again, there was no quorum. The third time, they sent out not a new draft, but the same draft as the second one, 
And they also sent out the militia to bring back to the to Independence Hall in Philadelphia those representatives from the southern and western states who did not want to come. They, they brought them into Hall, Independence Hall, bound and gagged them so that they would have a quorum, and they passed the Constitution. Of course, when they released the southern and western representatives, those representatives decided they would rather turn the country back to the Tories, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to England, than to live under this Constitution. A compromise was made, and uh, the ten uh, amendments to the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, was agreed to be put into effect. However, it took until 1813 for the final uh, uh, amendment to be passed, because it did require a very stringent uh, three-quarters of the states in order to you know, pass an amendment like that. Um, the fourth thing I want to talk about is the framers not trusting us, of course, because they did have um, a president who would be elected by the uh, 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 committee College. that was su suggested, that, that would so-called represent the actual popular vote. Senators were appointed by the governors of the states, and the House of Representatives, the representatives were uh, elected by only those people who owned property. And the property didn't matter too much. As long as you owned property, you were able to vote for a representative. That, that's, that, that's a pretty uh, narrow view of popular uh, democracy. They did not, although there was discussion of it, uh, establish a unicameral government where there would be only one house uh, that would be represented by, uh, that would be consistent of uh, the, uh, the House of Representatives, representatives from the people. But they did include the Senate, which was a guard against the popular vote. And I, I've said this before. My great, 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 great grandfather was John Marshall, the second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He convinced President Adams that not to worry, the, prop, the big property owners in the uh, United States would not have to fear anything because if he had a scheme that if any law were passed that was not in the interest of these large landowners, he would declare it unconstitutional. And he did so. Forty-four perfectly valid laws were declared unconstitutional by him, which we look upon today, those laws, as perfectly valid. Nonetheless, he served the interest of the wealthy at that point. And that the wealthy at that time is now represented by our speaker's 20 to 25 percent uh, disapproval rate. I think we're in a losing battle there. I see um, one problem with your um, ideas, and that is there are two types of people that um, gain seniority, the very best and the very worst, and you'd be throwing away all of them. You, then the very worst, you get the best of the getaway drivers, and you get the best of the machine builders like Johnson and Daly, and you also get people like um, Feingold and Danny Davis who are among the very best that we get in Congress and the Senate, and I'm afraid that the vacuum to be filled first would be the, the worst of the worst. I also think that um, the way you, the, you do the approval ratings can be manipulated. We take, for example, unemployment. In my lifetime, I think the way that they measure unemployment has changed four or five times. It's not just whether you have a job or not. It's more complicated than that for some reason. And um, I think that also it could be used to change control of the government from Democratic from Democratic to Republican, and it would be there are other, obviously, cases of misuse that could be um, used, and I think that's a problem. And I think that the, your, um, the, the symptom that you're trying to cure is that people do want more direct democracy. That's both what's um, fueling the Tea Party and the Occupy movement. And I think the best way to get direct democracy is to change the things that give incredible advantage to incumbents and give incredible advantage to the two-party system. Thank you.
Well, uh, thanks to the speaker. I'm glad there's a few Eisenhower Republicans left over. Uh, thinking back, I uh, was a state employee and I worked under uh, Governor uh, Thompson and Governor Edgar, and I guess they weren't the worst people in the world. Um, in January, I was in Egypt, and I was totally surprised. But I didn't feel lonely. Hardly anybody saw it coming. Uh, in September, uh, there was the uh, Occupy Wall Street. And again, I was totally surprised. And uh, again, I didn't feel lonely. Most people didn't see it coming. Uh, I keep plugging along. I keep writing my letters. Uh, I see uh, through Jane Adams Senior Caucus and Lakeview Action Coalition, I see legislators uh, face to face. Uh, I even got arrested once or twice. So I'm doing what I can, but I think uh, the speaker's ideas would have been great maybe 30 years ago, but I think it's too late. I think uh, other things are going to happen. And it's going to be like Egypt in January, and the uh, Occupy Wall Street. I think it's going to go too fast, and uh, we're late by a couple, maybe 30 years. Thank you. It's too late, man. It's too late. We can't fix the problems. I just, I just love it here. <laughs> you know, every time I come, I learn something. And this time, I think there were two things. One of them was the idea of thinking of the political of the Congress as a body, just like we think of a corporation as a body, and that the body has individual rights, and that the Congress. Is an, think of that as a body, and as a political body, we're voting on that political body once every ten years, up or down. And that was like a wonderful concept. And the other one was the attachment of the early history of this country to geography, to representation. I had never heard it expressed that way, but. You can see that if there's a, a how at that time geography was attached to economics, all right? At that time, you had your business and your geography co coexist. Coincidentally existed in the same space, you know. And now, 200 years later, 300 years later, we have evolved so, so, so far economically that, as an old member here used to say, and I have a lot of time, was that. In the, he used to tell the story that in the beginning, people used to trade elephants. But then, they realized elephants were cumbersome. So they put them in a cage, in a corral, and they traded certificates of elephants. And then, somebody realized the, the the corraller realized that he could issue more certificates than he had elephants <laughs> because nobody really came to get an elephant. Okay? And then people got so used to what the current, what their certificate said, which said this is this represents one elephant, that they became so detached that they said that's an elephant this piece of paper okay. and we have with what recently happened with the derivatives and the whole financial thing and what
very recently happened in Europe, where Greece went into default, they got a 50% haircut, but they arranged it so it was voluntary, so that the derivatives wouldn't kick in, because the derivatives would kick in on a default, and not on a voluntary production of principle. Okay? So, we have gone from a very location-based society, people, and I mean everybody was very location-based, to what we are now, which is we have so much money, and money is so fluid that we are really very independent. We don't really need our families. We don't really need our friends. We've got money in the bank. Okay? You're right. And, you know, that's the problem. You can be too rich. <laughs> we are indeed too rich. My problem, Bob. Okay? <laughs> and Just too fucking without rich. solving, not without solving, I, I see that as what we've evolved into. I see no way around that evolution because it has so many benefits. And we don't know how to deal with it. All right. I, I would like to thank our speaker for a presentation I feel was pretty well done and for a refreshing new viewpoint on change. We've all heard a lot of people come up here and talk about change and change. We'll change this, we'll change that, but it always seems to be the same thing. But this was, I thought, a refreshing new idea, if nothing else. And one thing I'd like to say, one of the things that make our, con our, our Constitution and our form of government work is all the checks and balances built into it. Mm -hmm. The Congress checks on the President and the courts. The court check on the President and the Congress. The President checks on the Congress and the courts. I think in the long run, this is just another check and balance that he's proposing. But the people checking on the Congress. And I think the checks and balances built into our government will, will eliminate many of the objections to this system because someone stated during the question and answer, well, what if during the one year between the two votes they go out and do all these, put in these laws increase spending and such to try and win popularity, well, we would hope that the president sitting at that time would realize this and veto a lot of those bills. The checks and balances are still there. And I think a point that, unless I'm missing the speaker's point myself, and you all are right, a point you're all, uh, that was in general missed was this check isn't on individual congressmen. It's not on individual ideas. It's on the Congress and what they're doing as a whole. And with the 75% approval criteria, it would eliminate the possibility of some small group or one state or one political party from dominating that election and getting things done. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So the 99% shouldn't run. More good luck. Yeah. He doesn't want the 99%. Because they're one group. Because they're political I just have a quick summary. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what? Does that thing is on and off? Yeah. All right, louder. The question I have is, you know, louder. the obvious, shut the hell up, Jim. Yeah, louder, he's right. Things, things get better when a majority of the public 
and faces and accepts the reality of what's going on. As long as we re ignore reality, things don't get better. Once the public accepted the idea of smoke-free restaurants, we got smoke-free restaurants. Um, you did, Charlie? We are we're a nation of laws. We're, we're supposed to, we're told as citizens that we have, uh, we're raised as law-abiding citizens. Just the opposite of what the good Germans were. Uh, that's where the, the term Nazi and good German comes from. People were following laws that were made to enable them to say this is legal, very large crimes against humanity. There's a big difference between the law and what's right, what's legal, and, and what, uh, you know, the principles that Jesus laid down in other people from other religions. For the last 30 years in this country, we've allowed the concept to spread that the laws of the land do not apply to rich people. We've, uh, we've allowed, the, we've seen 32 years, and especially the last decade, of the greatest, most concentrated crime spree of rich people in the history of our nation. It wasn't $700 billion in the bailout, it was $7.7 .7 trillion. That amounted to $96,000 for a family of four. Everybody in the country could have been given a bailout, $24,000 per person. That's how much money was showered on rich people and the bankers. In 2000, yeah, we allowed, we have to come to grips with the reality that what we're looking at in our Senate, Congress, and the Supreme Court, these institutions, uh, the, the Congress is not a Senate and Congress, it's a whorehouse, an intellectual whorehouse run by highly paid intellectual prostitutes that are buried in money from billionaires. When they get there, they don't give a crap about us. They're, they have two jobs, shovel money to rich people and keep voting for the trillion dollar a year rat hole of our military empire worldwide that is just devastating people all over the world and, and killing America, the middle class. In 2000, we allowed corporate criminals to take over the White House. The Supreme Court issued the single most corrupt ruling in the history and said George Bush was the winner. When the New York Times and all the others had the vote counts, they knew he was the loser. In 2004, the criminally corrupt media sold us nationwide, nationwide, wall to wall, 24-7. It was close, but George and Dick were the winners. When the reality was, they were blown out at the polls in a landslide. It was it's a bigger landslide than eight with 208 with Barack Obama, and then they just switched the vote totals in 11 states. Corporate criminals running our voting machine. We keep talking about these people as our elected representatives. For eight years, we had a massive number of corporate criminals masquerading as our Congress critters. I coined a new phrase, crime act. Not Democrat or Republican, but write it down or spell it. C-R-I-M-A-A-C. A crime act is a corporate criminal masquerading as a Congress critic. <laughs> and our, the Republican Party is almost 100% crime act. Uh, the Democratic Party is 30 to 40% crime act. So the 20 or 30% of decent, honest people that we've elected can't get anything done because there's a 60, 70, 75% of crime acts running our country at the top. <laughs> We're living, you know, with just an invasion of crime acts all through 26 Republican governors. These people aren't politicians. They're, they're, they're paid intellectual prostitutes to do the bidding of the corporate billionaires that ran all the television ads to get these people elected. And as I said, if we accept the reality that our country is run by these people, face the reality, then we can move forward as a nation with beneficial solutions very, very quickly. Other countries are showing us the way. Here are some, some beneficial realities that we're going to be talking about on February 11th. That's, I'm going to do a presentation, a whole evening of solutions, things that are being done around the world and could be done here if people will face up to the reality. We have to prosecute criminals at all levels. We, and the first step is to recognize that there are criminals. Germany, Germany, for example, put up enough solar panels recently to shut down 20 nuclear power plants. Solar energy at today's prices is vastly cheaper than nukes. Solar panels in Chicago are five to ten per, five to ten times better rate of return on the investment than leaving money in a CD or a treasury bill or an interest. 
wind and solar are going up all over the world. Other countries are beginning to find with tribunals, you know, in the, they're, they're finding that Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld are guilty of international war crimes and they're sending out, uh, putting out arrest warrants for them. These people can't travel freely around the world. Why is the rest of the world facing the eight-year crimes of the Bush administration while we allow, while allow all our crime acts that are running our Congress and Senate to keep ignoring the crimes of the eight years of the Bush crime spree? You know, the first step is to face the reality and talk to people about it. We can bring the troops home from everywhere tomorrow and s spend a fraction of that money on cheaper energy alternatives that are here in America. And the money that we save could provide everybody with affordable universal health care like every other civilized country on the planet has. It's just an obscene debate to allow people to say, well, we can't afford Obamacare. We can't afford universal health care. As I said, February 11th, if you're tired of hearing people complain about problems, come here and get a printed list of all the, the solutions, the top 20 solutions that are being implemented by countries all over the world and states all over the United States. There's good stuff going on everywhere that our media doesn't tell us about. They tell us about Lindsay Lohan and Tiger Woods. It's time for us to talk about and face reality. Thank you. They won't tell us. He was precise, coherent, and not as your mouth, but he was trying to do. And his cadence was perfect, and therefore he made a good classroom teacher. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, however, uh, there we go. if you got a problem, you got to know the cause of the problem, the side of the side. Now, if you playing poker with a bunch of people every Friday night, nobody wins but Joe Blow. And Joe Blow, but you don't know this, Joe Blow got a mob death. Over seven months, he ends up with the pocket. Guess what somebody said? Man, we got to do something about Joe Blow. Now, how we're going to have to. So, well, I understand so and so over there at the casino gives a class on poker and other card games. We'll go over and improve our skills and so forth. Give me a break, please. Yeah. How you going to solve the problem with skill when the man is playing with a mob deck? You got good intentions, ain't nothing wrong with that. So I can understand you trying to get even with him. Therefore, this leads me to this, and that is his suggestion is like the group of players that is losing to the people that are my pet. I mean, the guy with my pet. And I also want to mention that I saw some figures up there on the board when he was here that 90% of the people vote the people to come back for the next turn. Now, I done met quite a few individual intelligent people. In fact, a few of them is here, at least one or two tonight here, that I would call intelligent. Uh, and I usually have a pretty negative thought about the masters, because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm serious. Sometimes the individuals are intelligent, and when, they, when you look at the masses, they become real dumb. However, <laughs> I, I might have to change my mind, because if 90% of them sit in the same tricks That's back to the Senate in the, in, the, in the House of Representatives, they own their son. The next yeah. asshole going to do just what the other one did. Okay. So why Thank waste you. my time voting yeah. for some new dude? He's going to end up doing just what the rest of them did. Bye, now, why I'm a, not, what are you going to give her? How about, you know, Chan for the, the speaker's uh, proposition here is, <laughs> <Ball, laughs> I know what the problem is. The problem is we don't have a government. Your government been hijacked. The Constitution and the Founding Fathers talked about for the people, we the people, so and so, and the people are the government. We are not the government. Therefore, the House of Representatives and the Senators do not work for us. They work for the people that hijacked the government. And that's who they are responsible 
two. That's who uh, the people that give them the money. Those are the people that do whatever that the representative is in uh, incentive to do what they want to do. They want to do. They pass laws that allow these people, like Anderson said, <laughs> they are criminals. Because you can read about it, you know about Wall Street and all that. Whole bunch of folks should be in jail the day they're not there. But I would tell you that 95% of what they do is a lot of it is legal. Why? Because they own the Senate, they own the House of Representatives. So they can pass whatever law. Somebody mentioned that. The lobbyists go over there with the bill in their hands, and say, this is what I want y'all to pass. And that's what they pay, the lobbyists. Now, as long as these things are happening, why are we wringing our hands? The government belongs to those folks. And if you think those people that own the government ain't going to challenge us when we come up with some scheme that is a direct threat. Now, what he said might not be no threat because they see that it ain't going nowhere. But if you come up with a direct threat, these people are the ones going to resist us. And saying the public, yeah, numbers make a big difference. Ain't no way in the world no two people can overcome 2,000. But two people can come over, overcome 2,000 when they control the television, they control your city, they control your regulators, they control your, your, your school. They can overcome, two people can overcome 2,000. And the public is divided because they've been condi conditioned to divide. The guy in charge is not going to make a coherent enemy, a forcible enemy. What he wants is docile, follower, consumers that believe in everybody but themselves. Yeah, he doesn't like to hear him. Uh, I too would like to. Too. Uh, I too would like to thank the speaker for a very interesting and cohesive presentation. Yeah, somebody mentioned that to me. Um, my problem with it, however, is that in the is that if we open up the Constitution to his amendment, we also run the risk of opening it up. Any number of what, for lack of a better term, I will call nut amendments. Yeah. <laughs> include everything from banning abortion uh, to banning burning the flag. And I'm extremely dubious, therefore, about amending the Constitution for any reason. Uh, the last time we tried this, that's when they drafted on the 18th Amendment, and it was called Prohibition. And we wound up having to pass another amendment to repeal that. So I'm not necessarily in favor of tinkering with the Constitution. Your idea is not a bad one, but nevertheless, I view it with somewhat with misgivings. I was also under the impression, contrary to what Joe had said, that governors did not appoint senators prior to the passage of the 16th Amendment that they were instead elected by the state legislatures. And that, that was how the senators got in. And that's how Abraham Lincoln was defeated in 1858 by Stephen Douglas. The legislature re-elected Douglas, not Mr. Lincoln. Uh, finally, I spoke of President Eisenhower a, a while back. Now, it's true that I am, instead of being an Eisenhower Republican, and I am a Kennedy Democrat. Having said that, President Eisenhower, while he was not a great president, was certainly a good one. And it's important to remember that on his last day in office, in his farewell address, he warned the people against the acquisition of power, whether sought or unsought, by a military-industrial complex. That, unfortunately, has long since come about. And we are paying the price for that now. Thank you.
I feel that uh, Bill had a very good subject and some very interesting ideas. And as he pointed out, Congress is a mess and uh, with pervasive pledges uh, to special interest groups. And it, in my opinion, the mess in Congress is the worst problem this country has because nothing's being solved. Um, but however, uh, because of the difficulties, as he said, it could take a long, long time to get this amendment. And it, it's difficult to get amendments going to begin with. So, and because of the seriousness of the problem with how badly Congress is functioning, I would hope that we could push for shorter term um, solutions, I mean, more immediate solutions, which would be um, uh, such as getting um, rid of gerrymandering, which the speaker did mention as a problem. And of course, we have all these extremist uh, members of Congress because of that. And uh, this, as people probably already know, can be done by having uh, redistricting of uh, Congress and legislatures done by a neutral commission rather than by the uh, state legislatures. And the other uh, more doable uh, reform would be public funding of campaigns. Again, it's everybody's mentioned the campaign funding problem corrupting uh, members of Congress. Uh, in my opinion, term limits would be a good idea too, but that could also be very difficult because it would require Congress to start the ball rolling for um, a constitutional amendment and Congress would never agree to would never want to have term limits limiting themselves. Thank you. Jean, you hijacked my talk. <laughs> uh, but I have a little bit to add. I agree to, uh, that you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, but first of all, uh, just to address the, uh, the issue of incentive versus punishment, uh, I think punishment is a wonderful incentive to shape up bodies. And as, as Howard Zinn said, uh, the prisons are full of little thieves while the big thieves are running the country. So maybe we should give a chance to the little thieves and do more here. Uh, but there were... Um, three issues that were brought here in regards to the talk. The main one, of course, is the Congress is making decisions based on money or on those corporations who own them. Um, Margaret, you brought an important issue of the rights of minorities, and, and Eugene talked about uh, misinformation, lack of information, and uh, uneducated public. Um, and those are good points. Um, I feel that all of them basically kind of related, and again, to the issue of who owns the media, for example. Um, the media, Fox News, those are the sources of misinformation and disinformation. So uh, the, the issue of um, voting or um, assessing the performance of the Congress as a whole is a little problematic when um, there is so much misinformation. Yes. For example, if you take the tax cuts as being so successfully among some people um, packaged as a job creation. Okay, so uh, you know, the, the popularity is not always reflecting the quality of the decision for the good of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, another thing is uh, the, the, the rights of, of minorities, too. Um, and that has to do with quality decisions that will be based on again, general enlightenment and education if we free the media, again, to be independent and not based on uh, those uh, private uh, insurance companies. Um, how to do it? I, I see no other way than uh, changing the campaigns, having federal allowance. Uh, there are some other ideas like the voucher, the one that uh, Leslie was 
was uh, suggesting, there are many suggestions, but, and, and again, um, whoever talked about uh, two parties, yeah, allow uh, multiple parties um, to shape uh, the, the, the idea of the referendum. Um, and as far as an overall, uh, somebody here brought a very good criticism of the overall assessment of Congress as one body. Um, but, uh, you know, the problem is that people will escape their individual responsibility and we want to watch um, uh, at their individual responsibility and uh, accountability of every member. And again, I think that if they do not respond, to not try and bribe them even more and wait 10, ten years, um, I see punishment again as a great incentive. Yeah. One of you guys have got to remember that governments only exist by the consent, whether it be explicit or implicitly, of the people. A dictatorship <laughs> could not exist without some form of cooperation of the, of the political elites and even amongst the people not to do or not to overthrow their own government. In a recent book or publication that's been around for a number of years called From Dictatorship to Democracy, that one of the ways governments stay in power, particularly dictatorships, is to produce and, and have one group fighting another group. And when those groups realize that it's in their best interest to cooperate and overthrow the effective powers, either through some form of demonstrations or elections, change starts to happen. If you don't believe me, look at what's going on with the Arab Spring. Because a lot of those people in that movement have been using that the techniques described in that very book. They were also used in the former Soviet Union countries to help overthrow some of the more uh, over some of the more outrageous older communistic regimes. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and look at the web and Google from dictatorship to democracy. What I see here in our United States right now is we are getting the government we deserve. We're still allowing these congressmen to come in, whether incumbents or not, whether they're 98% or not. We see it as obstacles. But you know, one thing about these 99% are movements and the Tea Party and everybody else is there is a growing level of frustration out there. And wait until those disparate bands come together and say, hey, look, we want change. That's when we're going to see change. I like our speaker's proposal for the 10 years accountability, but for real change to happen, we're going to have to stop fighting with all these opposition groups amongst ourselves and find a cohesive whole in the center that is reasonable and rational so that we can get rid of the control of these extremist groups. Like it or not, we still have power in the ballot box. We can still vote out the incumbents. Yes, there's a lot of influence with media and money and all this other stuff, but frankly, I still have hope in direct election of senator and, and, and just in the direct consent of the people for the government. And there has been a lot of non-violent revolutions in the world in the last few years that prove that governments can and do have to listen to the consent of the people, because without it, they simply cannot govern. Take a look at the book, From Dictatorship to Democracy, it's a short 98-page treatise, and what you will find is a blueprint on how we can make better changes to our own government. And believe it or not, because we still have the ballot box and we still have the other items, it's just a simple matter then of changing what will drive the incentives of the politicians. Either go into those corporate cronies or going to a new American center. Hello, my name is Ivan Lueda. Uh, I enjoyed the speech very much. It was very thought-provoking. 
Uh, and I, it prompted me to put together or, or at least think about a few thoughts that I'm not sure are connected or not, but I, I wanted to communicate it to the audience here. Uh, one of them is FDR. Uh, he's a three-term president. And had he not died in office, he might have very well been a four-term president. So this term of our elected officials, I think we have to be open to it, term limits. And I think that's the thrust of the speaker's uh, 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 position or his uh, proposed amendment. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, uh, we should be so set in stone uh, on that principle. And, and, and the rest, uh, uh, his particular plan is on the margin, but I think it's the thrust is term limits. And, uh, uh, and so that would be one of the, uh, the ideas that was prompted. Another, uh, thinking about, uh, someone mentioned about the, the, fret, the, uh, the present constitutional right we have to burn the flag. Uh, that goes to political speech, what, much of what we're doing today, this evening. And what's the point of political speech if we cannot politically act? By changing the Constitution a little bit. But, you know, we went through 250 years, or however many years, with our present system, we made changes during the historical process to amendments. Perhaps the speaker has voiced something mechanically to be imposed on our present system that can address some evils uh, in our present system. And uh, there's something, you know, in, in all of our lives, you know, going through our educational system here in the United States of, uh, under the assumption we've all been educated by our system. Uh, we're taught at an early age that this Constitution is gorgeous, we can't, you know, God bless the flag, etc. You know, we're American citizens, patriotism is part of our genes, as, as it applies to all homo sapiens, sapiens, and all other regimes. Uh, but in, in our political system, when time is so expensive, there was a speaker who mentioned, you know, and it's in our everyday life, you know, if you want to buy advertisement, it's very expensive. And if you're trying to adjust the system, it is so easy for, for an opponent who wants the present system to stay in place to say, oh, the Constitution is precious, we can't change it. Uh, imagine trying to rebut that in a 30-second soundbite. It, it's impossible. Uh, the speaker had an hour today, and he, he gave us a framework, but that's only an hour, and it can still be... Uh, it deserves many, many more hours. So under the present system, if we have the, the, uh, the, some groups of, that are rich and very politically powerful, and we don't like that, uh, I think the assumption is those people like it exactly how it is. So don't change the system. Leave it exactly as it is. Uh, I'm reminded of a New Yorker uh, cartoon uh, a couple weeks back, right on, the, right on the front page, and it showed a bunch of plutocrats with signs of protesting like our uh, Occupy Wall Street folks and Chicago folks, and they, they had signs. Leave the system exactly how it is. Uh, and that was the humor behind uh, the cartoon. And, um, oh, the other bit of disjointed thought was um, somebody mentioned a story about elephants, uh, and uh, the Carthaginian general was having problems transporting his army across some mountain range in northern Italy to invade Rome. Uh, and uh, a friend told me recently that he got the elephants over uh, by, uh, by sending the female element elephants first. So I don't know, that, that I'll end it there. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for uh, giving us uh, uh, good food for thought. Uh, I am a little suspicious, though, of it, uh, skeptical of opening up the Constitution and making these changes because, well, for one thing, I know I think I think the general discontent stems from our desire for a rise in the real the real wages. We want to see a, a rise in the real wages of a general rise in wages, and, and we're not getting that. And I think uh, that this change in the 
system that you want, I don't think it would do anything to, to affect that, really. Uh, what we have here is a good old-fashioned land bubble depression, yeah. like we've had many, many times before. And that's the source of our, as you know, Henry George wrote back in 1879, in Progress in po Poverty, uh, the cause of industrial depressions and, and its remedy. Uh, you know, we know, we know the problem is it's, it's the uh, private ownership of land, this idea of, uh, you know, everybody wanting to hold hold land and make a buck off of it, you know, speculating. You know, I mean, everybody, I didn't hear any of these 99 percenters uh, complaining from, uh, you know, 1980 till 2005 when they were going to the bank, borrowing 100 or 200,000, you know, buying some house and then flipping it in five years for 100,000 profit and then buying another place, you know. And uh, just about everybody else uh, that owns a house, nobody wants to give up their little privilege there. You know, owning real estate, owning, owning land, not a house, but owning land is a, uh, you know, it's a privilege. It, you know, allows you to own a piece of the earth. You know, you know, and, you know humans are the only animals on earth that pay to live here. Uh, you know, and this idea that, uh, you know, uh, that you can have uh, in per perpetuity you can own a piece of the earth and then charge all who come after you uh, a toll to live, work, and play there, you know, for your own private profit. So you don't have to work, you know, no toil on your part, you're a landlord, you can just collect, and, you know, that's that's the problem, you know, Adam Smith said this around page 90 of uh, book one of the Wealth of Nations, that the, that the, that the produce of labor goes to, ends up going to the landlord, and that and he summed, up this, summed this up in book one, uh, the conclusion when he said uh, that uh, all benefits of a society accrue to the landowners, and that's what happens. So all these little fiddle faddlings on the margin, on the edges, like well, we're going to do this with interest rates or that. We're going to have tax incentive, and we're going to you know have a union, and you know we're going to have a tariff law. And but all that's just fiddle faddling around, and things like like this messing around with elections. You know, all that's just fiddle faddling around. The real the real uh, issue here is that all benefits of a society are going to end up accruing to the landowners anyway. Now I've told you guys the story about you know, what happened when uh, you know, this little set, uh, turnaround of Robinson Crusoe, if he would have landed on the island and Friday would have been there first. And he would have uh, allowed Robinson Crusoe to stay there if he would have paid rent. And uh, Robinson Crusoe says, well, what's, what's the rent? And, and uh, Friday says, well, you know, it uh, takes me eight hours a day to catch one rabbit with my bare hands. And uh, that sustains me until the next day. And uh, so, so, your, uh, so your rent is going to be one rabbit to me, you know. And he goes, you can catch one rabbit for yourself and one rabbit for me for rent. And then, you know, that's, that's your rent. So Robinson Crusoe said, well, yeah, I've got another choice. That's what I'll do. So every day he's out there toiling for 16 hours and he'd come back and he toss a rabbit to Friday, and he'd eat his rabbit, and he'd go out the next day and catch two more. Well, Friday's just eating this up, man. He's laying back, laying in the sun, relaxing, you know, having a cocktail, and, you know, Crusoe's out there getting his rabbit for him. And then one day, Crusoe gets the bright idea that, hey, if I make a spear, maybe I can get more rabbits. So Crusoe finds a stick, he finds a sharp stone and some vines, and he fashions himself a spear, and lo and behold, he gets 22 rabbits. And when he goes back to Friday that night, he's got this whole stringer of rabbits, you know, and he flips Friday his rabbit, and then he's sitting there, and he's cooking his, and he's showing Friday his spear. He goes, look at this, man, this really improved my productivity. You know, like, 22 rabbits I got today with this spear. And uh, Friday says, well, that's all, that's all great, Robinson, but uh, I got bad news for you. Tomorrow your rent's going up to 21 rabbits. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happens, uh, you know, no matter what you do, the reason why uh, we, you know, Henry George wanted to figure out why do we still have this persistence of poverty after in his modern age of 1879, and the reason is because the rent keeps going up. It's the price. The landowners just keep, you know, raising the rent, and it's why. Why is you know why is it so hard to make it go over here? You know, unless you're really really making a big dough. Landlords, they have the they have the real estate price like everybody's making sixty seventy thousand a year. And that's how they're going to price their rent. And uh, if you're not making it, that's that's tough shit. If you're not making that kind of dough, 
man, you're just barely, you know, keeping your head above water. People are paying what? Uh, 25 to 50 percent of their income is rent. And then you got, then we're paying taxes on top of that, which is really, uh, you know, instead of rent, we should be paying, we should be paying rent, but we should be paying it to the to the government, to the back to the community for the use of that land. All set. Yeah, more fiddle pills. So, <laughs> tell the story. Well, you know, people learn through repetition. We always learn yeah, in school. You have to tell students yeah, yeah. something three times before you sink it in their heads. That's the, the McGuffey Reader approach. approach. That's the McGuffey Reader oh, approach. The rabbits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you the story about the apples next time. Oh. <laughs> represents a constituency of at least 700,000 persons. And that's, you know, you, how, how do you get to know your congressman if you're only one? Or how does the congressman get to know what, what you need or, or what you need? Uh, if, you know, you're one of 700,000. Uh, it ain't like it was when they wrote the Constitution. I think it was something like 50,000 to uh, uh, a uh, representative. Uh, anyway, I, you know, we have these rotten borough states. I mean, that's our Constitution. But worse than that, you have two parties, the two party system, which freezes out any minority parties and uh, any, any new ideas or any programs uh, that might uh, uh, jar their protected interests. Uh, basically, we have a social economic polity which is generally characterized as state capitalist or capitalist state. And how do you change that? Well, you can reform it a little here, maybe a little there. And you know, when you press on one side of the economy, uh, uh, those who control the economy press on the other side and uh, all of a sudden, even if you uh, raise their taxes, they'll raise their prices. Uh, they'll, they'll somehow get their profit margin. The falling rate of profit uh, that uh, Marx uh, predicted may be real, but that's overall. And uh, it's not going to make uh, a change of the system until people wise up and start saying we need our interests fully represented at the point of production. That's why labor unions are really important. Now, uh, it's, and beyond that, uh, but labor unions aren't going to do it all. Uh, you have to be conscious of where the, the shoe is pinching uh, the public. And when uh, there are movements, uh, liberation movements, you have to be aware of uh, what they are, what their interests are, and uh, if, if you're, if, how, how they can work together to change for a more humane, a more democratic, uh, more uh, representative and uh, <coughs> fraternal, sororal, uh, 
familial human society. And that's why I have been very much interested in the uh, Marxist humanist movement uh, uh, represented by news and letters uh, publication. And, uh, I'm out of time. <laughs> All right, who spread pen, by the way? Anybody leave their pen here? Uh, if not, I'm going to take it then. Uh, first of all, again, hey, thanks a lot for putting together the PowerPoint, thinking it through, and generating a lot of discussion. Let's hear for our speaker here. Also, we want to welcome Frank, yes, your sister yeah. from Argentina. Was he a pain in the neck when he was a kid? <laughs> Would you take him back home for a month? We'll pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> she says, no, please. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to help you boys and girls out here, as I always have to do every week here. When you have a speaker here, you've got to look at their basic premise. And is it valid or not? And what is his basic premise? Is, is that the Congress of the United States does, is not working? Now, what precisely is that supposed to mean? It is it's not working. Now, in my little volunteer capacity as chairman of this committee for the Independent Voters of Illinois, at least once a month I sit down and I have to give a report to the state board on the functions of Congress in the previous 30-day period. And anywhere there's about 2,000 to 2,500 pieces of legislation pending. Uh, a lot of these are inseparably boring. Nevertheless, they're important pieces of legislation, and they seem to make it through with some discussion, analysis, and function on both the domestic and on an international level. This is certainly a complex enterprise. The operation of the United States. Uh, I, I basically had the view that it's functioning quite well. well. The only thing he pointed to was appropriations and most of it, I, I mean you may say the overall package, most of the funding legislation for the agencies that the government went through and not even a party of a thing that makes any mention whatsoever on the news or any point of contention. Uh, there's a subcommittee process. There's also multiple committees and things like that. It, it's, it's actually quite a lengthy process, and it doesn't really bring up that many issues. Uh, and it functions quite well in that regard. And I don't have any problems whatsoever. Uh, a lot of people, now what they're judging this on, if you go to this, the analysis I have of the laws of Congress and that they're looking at are the pieces of the legislation in the news and the computer boys and the analysts have ways of figuring out about, eh, let's say, six or ten issues that people focus on. And some of these are distraction issues, meaning the this, this, this stem cell kind of thing, gun control and keys of these. They're not major or significant pieces of legislation, and many of which are never going to have any way, any portion of feasibility of enactment whatsoever. They're used by uh, the guys in the campaigns to distract issues away from unqualified candidates, and everybody knows that. Some prayer in school, things <coughs> of this nature. Uh, they, you can also subscribe as I do something called the voter information services cost you a few bucks, but then again, you can actually track the record of how they're voting and how they're voting on the settlements of the people. And I use that to say, you ascertain whether or not my congressman is in fact working if you want. If you want to apply that utilitarian term, are they working? Yes, they are in fact working. I have no inordinate concerns whatsoever about the congressman from the third district of the state of Illinois. And if so, I let them know. And the things come like that. So you're taking a very small 
if you want a little snippet of information and you're making a big calculation that on the basis of looking at a few pieces of legislation, the entire Congress of the United States is not working, and therefore we're going to change the entire Constitution to do this. I, I'm sorry, I've got to say no, I really don't think it merits that radical change whatsoever on the basis of a very superficial analysis. All right, I'm going to jump around because i got to be eclectic here. And somebody mentioned that the 99 are extremists, which came to me as some surprise. I thought we were a mainstream of the American people. But now I find out that we're extremists, much like the Tea Party. Now, we are not like the Tea Party. Those people have no political views whatsoever other than a basic dislike of government. They have no contribution whatsoever to the political dialogue of this country. Simply less government. I don't want to have to pay taxes. Very serious to political science. Um, now, if you want what I would call from that movie where they, they said what we need is reform. You guys want reform, I guess. So if you want reform, I suggest you do something like this. There's two things I'm going to recommend you do. There's a thing out there called Project Vote Smart. And if you want, each and every one of you, without changing the Constitution of the United States, why don't you simply vote smart? And the other thing you can do, instead of changing the Constitution of the United States, is at 7 o'clock on December the 19th, the Monday, come to the meeting of the Independent Voters of Illinois, <laughs> National Affairs Committee, at 7 o'clock at 1325 South Bluff And we'll try to work towards getting the government we all want and need at this time. But thanks a lot. Come again when you got another one in you. Speaker gets the last word. Yeah, Speaker gets the last is. word. This guy votes smart. Speaker gets the last word. You guys are a bunch of dumb voters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where the pluses and the minuses are, and uh, and that's that's a challenging proposition for any speaker. Uh, Charlie, I might just mention to you that when I came to Chicago uh, from Minneapolis in 1970, uh, one of the first things I did was to join the what was called the in, uh, Independent Precinct Organization. Oh yeah, I, uh, we're still like you. Organizations, and uh, I was assigned the square block uh, from uh, Bellevue to Cedar to Sheridan, to Rush Street, I think it was. Oh. A lot of high rises. I was from Minnesota. Uh, you knock at a door, people answer the door uh, where I came from. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't exactly that way. <laughs> Just getting into the building was, uh, was a good thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, but it was a very, uh, a very appealing effort from my standpoint. I remember telling everyone why they needed to vote for Abby Stevenson for some reason. All right. <laughs> um, Anyway, um, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, number one, uh, very, very helpful uh, questions and, and comments, and I sure appreciate that. Uh, I, um, I do have a problem when people say our government was working just fine. Now, that is a fundamental premise of what I'm putting forward. Uh, just, just the other day, um, another uh, thing hits me between the eyes. Uh, you read about it in the paper about MF Global, the uh, firm that John Corzine was the chief executive of, a firm that went bankrupt, a firm that lost 600 to 1.2 billion dollars of customer money in the fast shuffle in terms of exchanging customer funds for depreciating collateral, a firm that went bankrupt for precisely the same reasons that the meltdown occurred three years previously. Dodd and Frank congratulated each other, they're now both of Congress, they've written up their Legacies and Dodd-Frank bill for financial reform is their great achievement. And precisely the same thing has happened. The only difference was that MF Global was not too big to fail. They let it fail. If it had been big enough, it would have been another meltdown. We have not done what we need to do at the government level to prevent that. And that is just one example of the kind of problems that we have. Uh, number two. Where? Can I meet you? We, um, we, are, uh, we are an example to the rest of the world. That point came up a number of times. We're the first country to go all in on democracy 
in the post-enlightenment period. A lot of other countries have followed our example. They've taken our Constitution, many times recreated it verbatim. Uh, there, there is now a battle of ideas going on right now. A lot of uh, countries, including ours, are looking at just how effective is the so-called Beijing consensus of managing an economy, of managing a country. And uh, a lot of people think it's got the upper hand, and it does have the upper hand in some ways. I spent a lot of time in China. I know what, what, uh, what, what they've got going for them. I also see enormous vulnerabilities. I personally believe it's a very vulnerable system. Uh, but uh, I think that we can make ours so much better, and uh, frankly, the public check in Congress, in my opinion, is part of that solution. Uh, somebody said we get, we've got the government that we deserve. Uh, I don't quite buy that. I think it goes the other way around. We've got the government that we settled for. And uh, we need to start asking some fundamental questions about how we can fix it. Public check on Congress is just one idea that I think deserves to be on the table. Everybody should be thinking about the other ideas that are going to help us get us there. They need to all be compared. They need to all be discussed. Some cocktail of them might be the, the right answer. But we need to challenge ourselves to, to make that effort, put these ideas on the table. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you all for coming. Hey, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, bye. Very good. Come again then yeah. when you get work on it again. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, get some money.